Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, bueno, para mí es un placer en, en un sector que, que, que ha basculado, que se ha vinculado tanto a la tecnología como a la logística, que ha evolucionado tanto desde lo físico a lo digital, a lo lógico, poder presentar esta serie de ponencias, ¿no? en el concreto sobre realidad virtual e inteligencia artificial. Eh, el bloque que vamos a ver ahora es precisamente realidad aumentada y realidad virtual, eh, que son, yo creo, realidades que, que ya están, y valga la redundancia, presentes ¿no? en nuestro entorno personal, en nuestro entorno de negocios, que es algo que ya que vemos en el día a día. Y bueno, para, para hablar de este tema, tenemos con nosotros a Matías Crespi, que es el dueño y fundador de una de las principales empresas eh, mundiales o punteras dentro de ese segmento a nivel mundial. ¿De qué nos va a hablar Matías? Pues nos va a hablar de de cómo durante la próxima década un entorno en el cual eh, el Internet de las cosas, los medios inmersivos y la velocidad de datos que estamos consiguiendo van a permitir pues, que fluya constantemente información y que se confunda lo, lo físico con lo, con lo digital. ¿no? Estaba pensando yo ahora este verano con mi hijo persiguiendo Pokémon GO por el jardín, ¿no? además como un ejemplo que podría ser muy cercano, ¿no? muy, muy visual de este, de este fenómeno. Eh, Matías va, va a hablar, como decía, de, de cómo ese flujo constante de, de información, de datos, pues nos va a hacer llegar, eh, pues bueno, experimentar una realidad mucho más rica, cómo va a superponer lo digital y lo físico. Y bueno, tiene una idea que yo creo es muy potente, que es la de comunicaciones ambientales, donde ya no solo los teléfonos inteligentes o las computadoras son las que transmiten datos, sino que es cualquier objeto dentro del entorno. ¿no? Eh, bueno, yo creo que es un tema muy interesante. Nosotros en DHL ya tenemos varias experiencias en este sentido, de utilizar, por ejemplo, la realidad virtual para que el picking en un almacén se haga simplemente pues, siguiendo las instrucciones que el operario le van llegando a sus gafas. Y bueno, hay, hay todo un mundo, yo creo, por explotar eh, de, también en la parte de en nuestro negocio, en nuestra industria en logística. Y nada, sin más preámbulo, paso la, patabla, la palabra a Matías. <laughs> Gracias. Hola. Gracias. Hola. I need the, the microphone. Disculpe, no hablo español muy bien, so I have to speak in English. I'm really sorry about this. Thank you for uh, getting me here today at this event. So yes, I'm going to talk to you about what we call ambient technologies. Uh, ambient technologies are essentially technologies around us in the ambient, so augmented reality, virtual reality, then there is mixed reality. So all these terminologies essentially describe a new form of digital media that is not anymore just confined to a screen, but is around us. And I need the clicker too. Yes. Let's see. Yes, okay. So I, besides starting a company that specializes in virtual reality and augmented reality, which is called Qubit Technologies, I also have a role as a research affiliate at the Institute for the Future, which is a research institute in Palo Alto, and where we do precisely what the name says. We do research on the future, how technology is going to change our ways of living, working, but also how, the, how our planet is changing, how our global ecosystem is evolving into the future. Today, I'm going to bring to your attention five elements about the future of retail. Um, I'm sure you have already heard uh, about some of these technologies. What I'm going to try to do today is to give you a, an interpretation perspective of how these technologies are going to change our uh, digital experiences with, with uh, retail. So, of course, the first element is the consumer. Um, obviously, the consumer should always be the center of our attention, but the consumer is changing. So, let me show you this video that was done once upon a time in between the 60s and the 70s that describes the vision we had in the 60s and the 70s about how the future consumer will eventually start shopping. A shopping trip at home using the interactive television screen as a vast catalog, reviewing the possibilities, narrowing the choices, comparing the products. 
If a selection is made, an electronic credit card triggers payment from the family bank account into the stores. Going to the office, in this case traveling entirely by cable. Talking to co-workers, attending a meeting. For individual work, the computer retrieves information or documents and aids in calculation and analysis. So the funniest thing about this video, which is quite scary, is that the woman is actually searching for a long sprinkler, which is a very engineered, man-like thing. Uh, she should be looking for a purse or something else. But anyways, this shows you the vision we had at the time of the future of digital retail. But today, the consumer is a bit different than the guy we saw there. Today, the consumer looks a bit more like this one. So essentially, the consumer is fully embedded with technology, with wearable technologies. We really uh, put technology on us. And, and we're also experimenting with implantable technologies. Our, our near future will, will show us uh, uh, amazing augmentation features that implantable technologies can give us. But what I'm trying to tell you is that all this technology around us is really changing our behavior. And um, there are some elements about changing uh, the consumer behavior that we should analyze. So first of all, the future consumer will use technology to essentially create a balance in between the possibility he has and the intentions he has. So what does he want to participate in? What does he want to share? What does he want to get? So he can use technology to hide and connect to different social identities or to isolate or integrate in larger communities or social systems. Uh, think about social networks. But it also be a matter of attention. So how can I use technology to better engage with things that I'm interested in? Or how can I use technology to shut down and ignore them? Again, do I buy new technologies? Do I invest in new technologies to access new features? Or do I dispose of old technologies that I don't need anymore? Or uh, do I use technology to reinforce my personality or transform, adapt myself to the new ways of being? So in, in, in the way of design thinking, we created uh, personas of the future consumer. And the first persona is, is the athlete. So the athlete, as you can see on the left, there is the balance of, of technologies that we use. So he, he uses technology to reinforce his personality. He's an athlete, he's, he's uh, a celebrity most of the time. So he has to reinforce his iconic personality so that fans can look up to him and refer to him. But at the same time, he has to use technology to hide. Remember that wearable technologies will give access to personal data, to data about how your body is performing. So if you are an athlete and you're paid by, you know, for your body performance, you want to hide potential dangers to your performance that your body data may highlight. Uh, and you also want to integrate in largest community, you want to be closer to your fans. And the fan on the other side uh, wants to reinforce his beliefs in the iconic image of the sports people they follow. They want to use technology to connect more and more to the show. They want to participate. They're going to use immersive reality, immersive media to be more connected to what happens when it happens. And they will invest in technology to do that. They will invest in technology that makes them live the experience more and more. The eater is a totally different personality. The eater is focused on using technology to live well, to access well-being, a healthier quality of life. So he's not trying to reinforce an old style of living, but he's trying to transform constantly their, their, their way of living to adapt to new discoveries and to new healthier uh, ways of, of interacting with food and drinks. He's also trying to connect a lot with, with information. He's using various devices to scan food or drinks that they are acquiring. Today, you can buy a food scanner, a molecular scanner that is this size, and it tells you what's inside any element that you scan. 
And he's also using technology to engage in other healthy living habits communities. The unwell, on the other hand, is using technology to reinforce his personality, to, to, to keep uh, uh, strong in a way, but he's also hiding, again, like the athlete, he's hiding what's, you know, what's not going so well. Perhaps he doesn't want his family to see that he is deteriorating in his illness. It's a possibility. He also wants to use technology to be less ignored and to engage more with communities because he may feel left out as he's ill, not feeling well. The partier, he uses, of course, technology to connect to everything that happens. He wants to be there. He wants to be in any social happening, even digitally. And he strikes a balance in between ignoring things that are not so cool and engaging in new things that are very cool coming out of social networks. And he's always showing brands. He's disposing brands that, and, and things that go out of fashion to invest in new objects and things that, that will become mainstream. Often he gets paid by, by companies to wear stuff. You know, he's the typical uh, social media influencer. Then at last, the worker. The worker is connected. He connects to uh, uh, gig work platforms, you know, uh, freelancer, uh, Upwork, to get more work. He's always connected and, and, and bidding on, on tasks to be done. And he, he uses technologies in between to, he, he tries to isolate from the tasks he doesn't want to work with, and he tries to integrate more with work that he wants to, to uh, pursue. And again, he's investing in technology to augment their capacities. So to, to be better, to be stronger, to be more efficient. And this was the consumer, so the, the personas of the consumer of the future. The second element is the IoT. So you heard enough about the Internet of Things today. What I'm telling you now is what the Internet of Things is becoming. So as you know, the IoT started as a network of connected things. So we, we essentially put connectivity into objects. Fair enough. But these objects, after we put connectivity, we put more technology into these objects. Today, we're not just able to connect the objects, but we're able to place very small uh, computing uh, devices into objects so they can become smart, they can calculate, they can sense things, they can gather data, but they can only just, uh, they, they do not only just gather data, they elaborate and calculate on this data on the go and, and act depending on the data they sense. So in the future, the Internet of Things will really become an Internet of Actions. This is how we defined it at the Institute. The Internet of Actions is made by interacting things rather than just connected things. So they're not just connected, but they're things that elaborate data and take action without asking for permission. They just act independently, connected to each other. In the Internet of Actions, and here we go into the more uh, uh, um, immersive technologies that I was going to talk to you about today. In the Internet of Actions, what we're really doing, because we're putting technology, calculus, processing power into things, into our physical reality, we are beginning to manipulate reality. So technology today gives us the ability to start manipulating the real physical world. And there are four things we have to keep in mind. Today we can animate objects and environments. I'm going to show you some things later about this. We can manipulate matter. There are companies that in their labs are actually working on molecular modulars to design objects of the future. So AutoCAD, for example, Autodesk is already working on the idea of a software that allows designer not just to design with shapes, but also to design by modeling the molecular composition of materials. So you'll have in the future, not just smart objects, but smart objects that change the shape, their status, depending on things that happen around us. Then, another thing, number three, we will have to encode human activity. How do you teach a self-driving 
car how to drive. How do you tell a self-driving car, hit the tree, do not hit the child? So the way you do this is you have to encode human values into machines. Machines have to learn what is important for us. The last one, and the most dangerous one, is that we're able to alter human perception. And think about what has happened in the US elections on Twitter and social networks in the last year. So today we have people, institutions, governments, who can use very simple technology like Twitter, like a basic social network that today everyone knows, to influence people. Imagine tomorrow in, in you know, five years or whatever, when we'll be able to really change the view of reality for people. And I'm going to show you how this is done in a minute. So alter human perception. Alter human perception. There is no battery. Can you help me out on this? I think the battery is running out. Can you change the slide? Yes. Thank you. Um, in the Internet of Actions, what we're doing is we are beginning to layer reality. This is a slide presented at the Magic Leap conference uh, this month in Los Angeles, where they, for the first time, presented a way of layering reality with digital layers. And it's not just about the Internet of Things, augmented reality. It's about creating these layers of data which regulate different parts of our lives and using different types of technologies to interact with them. Again, it doesn't work. Okay. So here, this brings to, to introducing the concept of ambient and spatial computing and mixed reality spaces. So those layers that you've seen described in that graphic before actually can look like this. And this is an example. Can, can we play the video? The technology today is... Nope. Try again. Not working. Not playing the video. It's not playing. OK, we'll show you another video then. Well, essentially, in this video, what you would have seen, but let me change the slides. What you would have seen is essentially this guy is seen through the glasses. And what I wanted to show you is two elements. One is real, one is digital, and how similar they are. But this is not really, it's not changing the slide, guys. OK. So the concept here is. Media is no longer something that is part of your environment. You no longer look around and see a screen showing you something. Media is really your environment in the future. You will be fully immersed inside of media. And this is the big paradigm change. No more media seen just on the screen, but yourself inside of media. And this is some of the elements, again, can we play the video, can we try? Before they worked, right? Yes, no. Very unlucky today with videos. So what, nothing is working? <laughs> now you have to go back. Wait, go back, go back. So this is when you say autoplay. It's a real shame if you can't see the video. Are you really not able to play the videos? Sorry, guys, we're trying to fix this. It's not quite the same if you can't see the videos. Okay. 
Okay, can, can we can we go? Wait, let's go back to the original slides. Okay, but wait, now they work. But let's go back. Great. That was perfect. We get in there. This is just part of the show. Just keep checking if you're attentive. Okay. Should I? Okay. Let's not. Let's go. Cool. So this is showing you how computing is scanning and these are real objects, okay? Obviously, this is a fake object coming on. And now you can really see the difference in between digital objects and the real objects. But in a minute, this will change. Now tell me the difference in between the real and the digital. Isn't this much harder? Even though there is much lower resolution. So what I'm trying to say here is, again, the way we can modify reality by inserting digital elements into it today is amazing. And we'll go ahead. let's go ahead now. No, wait. No, no. Next slide. OK. OK. Next. Now, this is some abstracts from the, the Magic Leap conference, but no, this is way ahead. Okay. Something is weird here. Wait, this is, I don't know what's happening, but. Okay. So, as for the future of retail, more. Uh, so, another thing we're working on, besides inserting elements into reality, so working on augmented reality, we're creating fully immersive. 3D digital spaces for e-commerce. So essentially, we're adding a third dimension to the internet by creating 3D shopping spaces where people can find more or less the same kind of experience they would have in a real shop. So if we can try and play this. These are essentially how yeah, you can render shops today in 3D. We're working on a number of projects of companies that want to create a next level experience for their customers. Of course, this is something that does not run on every device today. You probably have trouble using it on your phone today, but it's, it's technology that is coming. Right now, what we develop uh, essentially runs on laptop computers and on iPads where you can have this type of experience and soon it will be coming also to mobile phones. Of course, trying on things is the next big thing. Let's try and go to the next one, see what happens. No. Sorry, I'm just going with the flow. Okay, can we go to the one after? Okay, the one after again. We'll skip the, we'll try, okay. This is very difficult, but okay. Let's go to the last element. So the, the, the videos before were just showing you a number of uh, wait, I'm going to try again. Can you try again on this one? Because it's important. No. Okay. Um, sorry for the videos. I'm going to send everyone an email with the links to the videos after. The last element I wanted to talk to you about, besides immersive spaces and visualization, is artificial intelligence. This is something that, of course, everyone has heard about. Artificial intelligence, but let's look at it. Uh, uh, under a different lens. Let's call it the new marketing, because really artificial intelligence is based on data and interpreting data, finding patterns, and learning more about the consumer, in this case, e-commerce. Um, 
this is Mr. Babbage. Mr. Babbage is sometimes called to, as the father of AI. He was living during the Industrial Revolution. He was a mathematician, an engineer, and like many people at the time, was for, uh, working on different disciplines altogether. What he's most famous on is this machine he invented. This is called the Difference Engine. The Difference Engine is essentially the first form of calculator that we invented. It was used to just do calculations. But another thing that Babbage is known for, possibly less known for, uh, but equally important, is that he wrote a book. And this is, is through this book that he really became the father of AI, in a way. Because in this book, he first theorized um, how you can apply computing and numerical calculus to better organizing a production inside a factory. And obviously, this became later in the future what we call today business process reengineering. Uh, in the 50s, this guy, Herbert Simon, actually wrote by hand, and it was demonstrated by hand, the first uh, example of artificial intelligence piece of software. It was called Logic Theorist, and it was released in 1955. It was a very basic piece of software and probably the first implemented AI program because it was able to solve problems. It was aimed to help people solving problems. I don't know how many of you have seen this painting. Have you, has anyone seen this painting in this room? Just checking if you're still here with me. Not many, that's great. This was financed by a Dutch bank. Uh, and it's essentially a painting done by a machine, but a very special kind of machine. It's, it's a computer uh, that first analyzed using machine learning algorithms, how Rembrandt would paint his paintings, the techniques he would use, the colors, uh, the, the atmosphere, the lights, and, and the type of people he would portray. And this painting is actually then printed by a 3D printing machine through the data analyzed by artificial intelligence. So this is essentially an interpretation, this is essentially an interpretation by a machine of how Rembrandt could have done his next painting. And it's actually exhibited in the Rembrandt Museum in Amsterdam. But artificial intelligence is also this, is creating digital humans. This is one of the latest examples, I think she's called Maya, uh, of digital humans. She, she's the digital virtual assistant of Magic Leap, Magic Leap is a mixed reality company, heavily financed a couple of years ago by many technology companies, including Google, Microsoft, and so on. But look at the, at the level of, of realism. So this is you know, matching the graphics capabilities of today, real-time computer graphics, with artificial intelligence algorithm finding the patterns in human behavior and essentially replicating human behavior. And this will be the future of every brand's uh, uh, image, iconic digital assistant. You will shop with a brand and you will have something like this interacting with yourself, knowing your habits, possibly connected to your profiles, analyzing what you need, what you want, and possibly guessing what you're gonna buy next. And this is the evolution these virtual assistants will have. So we started with smart objects, Amazon Alexa, okay? Siri in the phone. Then we invented self-driving systems. Today we have self-driving cars. We are building virtual assistants, I'll just show you one. But these virtual assistants will soon become our virtual coaches. So they will help us access knowledge when we need them. They will teach us things. They will be our teachers. They will interpret pieces of knowledge for us when we need it. And eventually, they will start negotiating for products and services for us instead of ourselves. I don't know if you, I'm sure all of you have has tried to book an online uh, travel, a holiday. I mean, you can 
lose so much time in finding the best offer. You have, you know, the, 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 the amount of things you can find on the internet is huge. So why not have somebody that filters this information for us and negotiates constantly better products and services for us? This is what our digital assistants will do in the future. They will directly connect to different brands and providers and, and work out the best deal for us, even without us knowing it. So, for example, we can have digital assistants that are experts in different things that represent the brand. And whenever we will buy something, we will have a digital assistant that is expert in different products and different styles helping us out. Or possibly knowing what's the best present to buy for your friend. Because they will know, obviously, their birthday is coming up and you have forgotten. And this is where we are at today with artificial intelligence as well. Island air, you know, or the, the humidity, or the, you're just so easy to talk to. You know, you, you got a clear head, literally. I think we can be friends. Let's hang out and get to know each other for a little while. You're on my friends list now. Thank you very much. Have a great day. And sorry for the videos.